see. All right. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello and welcome, uh, good people of the empire. Uh, today is international talk like Jar Jar Binks Day. Um, Misa say why? <laughs> It's also National Hot and Spicy Food Day. And if that's too much for your delicate palate, we can slow it down with National Potato Day. I will celebrate by eating my body weight in tater tots, which is how I got to be this body weight. And lest we forget, it is still Romance Awareness Month. And what could be more romantic than cuddling up with your sweetie and joining us for tonight's Skeptical Inquirer Presents. As you know, this is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and of course, critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I, as always, am delighted to be your host. I'm a stand-up comedian and author. I am also the occasional co-host for Point of Inquiry podcast. And uh, by the way, the latest episode uh, from inside uh, the from the inside of being a mentalist features the one and only Banachek. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, as always, I will remind you as consumers of good information, it's, uh, I'm going to suggest that you grab yourself a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. It's available in print and digital. And the beautiful bonus there, I'm always going to remind you, is that you can get the print subscription, which gives you access to the digital subscription. That's more bang for your intellectual buck, everybody. So you can get either or both at skepticalinquirer.org. And please, please, please mark your calendar for the next Skeptical Inquirer Presents. On September 2nd, we welcome Carolyn Porco, who will be reminding us that there is no planet B. There will also be no me. <laughs> I have to go see a convention about a dragon. That's right, I'll be a dragon con. But fear not, uh, the good ship Skeptical will be hosted and helmed that episode by Jim Underdown. So you guys will be in excellent hands. And so let's begin, everybody. If you've been here before, you know that the flow of the evening is really easy. Uh, you're doing beautifully so far. Uh, I'll introduce our guest, they'll razzle and dazzle. And after which we will open it up for your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a little uh, icon that says Q&A. And that, of course, is the place for you to type your questions in the form of a question. And if you miss any of the talk tonight, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And now, everybody, this is the best part. This is what you come, up, come here for. Um, our guest tonight believes that skepticism and critical thinking skills are so vital to the well-being of individuals and societies that we have a moral, do you hear me, moral obligation to call out irrational beliefs and faulty thinking wherever present. Uh, he believes that a scorched earth policy of condemnation and name calling will never work as well. Uh, nudging and conjoling believers toward paths of passion and fascination for science and history. Uh, basically, fill in as many heads as possible with wonders of the universe and the thrills of real history and prehistory. And then maybe there won't be so much available real estate for nonsense. I like it. So if it's not obvious, uh, our guest is a passionate advocate for science and reason. Uh, as a journalist, he won uh, the Commonwealth Award for Excellence in Journalism, which is very cool, and the World Health Organization's National Award for Health Reporting. He's an author who writes about a variety of topics, uh, including poverty, um, conservation, religion, uh, racism, gender discrimination, space exploration, and human origins. He has written articles and essays for Skeptic, Free Inquiry, Reader's Digest, and is in the latest issue of Skeptical Inquirer, you guys. Very, very cool if you've gotten this in your box, if you subscribed like I've asked you to. Um, his article, right, uh, headlined here on the cover, How to Repair the American Mind, uh, optimistic indeed, but some really key and good stuff in here. Uh, so please, everyone, welcome our guest, uh, Guy Harrison. Uh, Guy, I am pleased to say uh, in the best possible way, you have the con. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Leanne. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you as a fellow Star Trek fan. We are, you yes. know, we've always we've always <laughs> known each other. But uh, yeah, I am so happy to contribute to this organization because uh, CFI, Skeptical Inquirer Magazine, has helped me along the way over the years. I mean, this this organization does great work, important work. So any way I can contribute, I'm happy to do it. Happy to be here. Now, I thought, since I have this uh, sophisticated audience tonight, I thought the best thing I could do, rather than just kind of repeat things you've heard before, I'm going to try to inspire you and put a little bit of a burden on you to help make this world a little better. Because uh, I don't have to convince you, we've got a problem. Homo sapiens, wise man, got a serious problem. We don't think, okay? We are emotional biased, deluded, crazed creatures. You know, we have these magnificent brains that can do so much. I mean, the, the human brain is awesome. The most complex thing in the known universe, you know, so far. And yet, it's, it's out to lunch 90% of the time. You know, I mean, we, to, just to be human, to be a human being means that you've got one foot planted in fantasy land you know, all the time. So that's a lot of our problems. You look around the world, you see war, poverty, you see exploitation, you see all these problems, destruction of the environment, and so much of it, not all of it, but so much of it, most of it ties right into poor thinking skills. We're just not good at thinking analytically, being good critical thinkers, seeing the big picture, thinking long-term, all these kind of things don't really come natural to us. And so my, my big message really in my career, in my writing career has been to try to teach people, to reach people and get them to understand how important it is to realize how your brain works, where it comes from. You know, the evolutionary history of the human brain is not only fascinating, but it's crucial to understanding how you operate today, why you buy certain things, join certain things, vote for certain people, do this, do that, make certain mistakes repeatedly often. The human brain, understanding it, getting, you know, you don't have to be a neuroscientist, but you can get a grip on, on at least the surface knowledge of how our brain works, how it's structured, the, uh, the heuristics, the biases, the little shortcuts the subconscious mind makes when it's making decisions. All these things we all do, our vulnerability to authority, you know, our, our urge to conform and join and be with others, all these kind of things. When you're not aware of it, you're just a puppet. You're bouncing around in life, being a victim half the time, and you don't need to be. So yeah, critical thinking, as this audience knows, is crucial. And so how do, we, how do we promote it? How do we make it more popular? How do we reach more people? Um, I constantly urge that it should be taught in schools from kindergarten to universities. As a matter of fact, classes, just, just standard curriculum should be critical thinking. Uh, brain, like I said, the structure of the brain, the workings of the brain, critical thinking skills, all this kind of stuff should be taught early and often, routinely. And, and I've done it myself as a former teacher. I've taught students how to question things, how to analyze, how to reserve judgment until you get more evidence, do these things. And kids of all ages, they just eat it up. They love it and they're good. At, they can be good at it. They really can. So it's a doable thing. We just have to find the will as a society, as a species. We've got to, got to one day wake up and say, you know what? We've got to teach our children how to think, not just teach them a bunch of facts, but teach them how to think so they can they can make it better throughout their lives when they, you know, encounter all the craziness out there. Um, parents should do this. Don't wait on the school board. Do it yourself if you're a parent. Help those children immediately, consistently teach them how to think. OK, but that's not all. All right. Debunking, um, exposing, you know, dismantling delusions piece by piece, something that Skeptical Inquirer does very well, by, by the way. Um, Absolutely important, crucial. We need more of it, but it's not enough. I'm convinced that it'll never be enough because what we need is we need to tap into 
more emotion. We've got to teach people. We've got to reach people out there and get them, get them tuned into the universe. Get them understanding that there is so much beauty and wonder all around us that you can find plenty of emotional excitement and awe in reality. You don't need to jump to the fantasies. You don't need to jump to the wild, crazy claims that excite you and come in fancy packaging because the universe has got us covered. It's all there. It's all there. And if you just become a lifelong learner, if you just open your eyes, look around, explore, get passionate about reality, wow, not only does it enhance your life, make things more interesting, but it also protects you. It can, it can lead you to living a more efficient and safer life. You know, you're less likely to, to uh, waste money, um, risk your health, you know, uh, your dignity, you know, following all these bogus claims that are constantly thrown at us all the time. So we have to find ways to inspire people, excite them about reality. Okay, the pursuit of reality. We never quite get there. I mean, trust me, there are things going on all around us. We're never going to figure out in our lifetimes. Okay, but we, we could move in that direction. or We can commit to seeking truth and reality. Just at least lean in that direction. That's good enough. That would be a massive improvement for our species. And so I'm always encouraging people to do that. And I want this audience, okay, CFI fans, skeptical inquirers, subscribers, be part of the solution. Don't be passive and just take care of yourself. Take on some responsibility. Put more energy into reaching out to others and in a positive manner, encouraging them to do their best to be more analytical, more skeptical, and explain to them, you know, help them understand how being a skeptic is not negative. Okay, it's, you know, I, I'm the most optimistic, positive person you'll ever meet but I am skeptical to the bone. You know, I don't accept anything. Even things that are almost certainly true, I always leave the door ajar. I'm ready to change my mind in a heartbeat if it proves to be wrong. You know, that's because I, I try to always maintain the mindset of a good, of a good scientist. And that means you're never 100% sure of anything. And that sounds maybe wishy-washy or like I don't have firm footing, but no, that's the best way to live. That's the best way to perceive the universe because you never do know everything, okay? Nobody's ever lived who knows everything is right about everything, okay? We all believe silly things, I often say. It's just, a, it's just a question of how many, how silly. So you've gotta be constantly in this mode of weeding out your mind and trying to get better, revising, reconsidering, changing your mind when appropriate, all that stuff. And the more people you can get on that train, the better society will be, the better our species will be. So I strongly encourage people to do that. And, and listen, you are offering people something. Remember this, okay? When you, when you reach out to others and you're trying to get them to dedicate themselves to being better critical thinkers, to being good skeptics in their daily life, when you're trying to do that, don't just teach them about certain mental biases, and leave it at that. Don't just explain to them while well, this belief or that belief is silly. Do more. Go the extra. Go the extra mile. You know. Try to uh, talk to them about about uh, the the age of the Earth, four and a half billion years. This amazing planet. All this stuff that's been going on. Life. Three and a half, four billion years worth of life on this one little rock here. So much going on. You know. And and you just tell them. You know, I've, I've seen people, their eyes get, they just light up when I talk about microbes or something or uh, viruses, you know, for example, viruses. I don't know about you, but I was not surprised that society has been struggling with a viral pandemic, struggling to understand viruses and how to react rationally to it all, because very few people know anything about viruses. They don't know anything about the microbial world. They just know germs, germs bad. I mean, that's sad, but that's kind of where most people are at. And I'll, you know, I'll tell people, I'll say, hey, do you know that viruses probably predate life on earth and these weird little nanobots of nature, these self-replicating things aren't even life. They don't even qualify as life really, and, and according to most scientists. And yet, if they were a life form, they would outnumber all life on Earth by far. They're just everywhere. They saturate this planet. 
And we know of, you know, several thousand different kinds of viruses, but scientists are confident there are many, many millions of different kinds of viruses. Some viruses infect bacteria, you know, specifically bacteria. Think about that. To, to some kinds of viruses, bacteria are these giant organic blobs that they go into and infect. You know, little bacteria, we think of these microscopic, tiny, tiny creatures, so much going on. And there's so many. It's shocking how many viruses are on this planet. Like my, my last book, At Least Know This, I have a small section on viruses. And I, I was stunned to learn that viruses in the ocean kill about 20% of all marine life every day, every 24 hours, 20%. Whales, plankton, sponges, I mean, viruses are whacking 20% of all marine life every day. Think about that turnover. Can you imagine? They're having that kind of regulating effect on the ocean. That's crazy. And, and the, you know, the ocean regulates life on land, the atmosphere. So think about how important viruses are. And now scientists are just discovering how important viruses are to the gut microbiome. And a lot of people more, which is great, they're now tuning into the gut microbiome, how important it is, all this bacteria we have living in our gut that help us digest food. And they have, uh, it impacts our, even our emotions, our mental well being, and stuff like that, which is amazing. But now they're starting to see signs that, well, guess what, viruses regulate that bacterial ecosystem in our gut, viruses. You know, viruses that not even necessarily bad, just in there doing their thing controlling that population of bacteria. I mean, it's really bizarre. So yeah, sorry, I'm getting carried away. Well, one more thing, L listen to this. I'll, I'll, don't get me going about viruses. But if we, <laughs> one scientist, uh, it's in my last book. Uh, he says, if you lined up every virus in the ocean from end to end, okay? That line, that rope, that tiny rope of viruses, all the viruses in the ocean, would reach out into space a hundred light years. I mean, think about that. That's crazy. That's that's incredible. So much going on in this planet. You know, I I can't. I, I'm not a botanist, right? But I know just enough about trees and plant life that <clears throat> I can't even walk in a forest without it becoming some kind of weird transcendental experience. You know, I'll stare at a tree. And I could just stand there for an hour, you know, yeah, hiking with me might be kind of, you know, boring, but I look at a tree and I just think to myself, my God, you know, what is a tree, a single tree? It's a home to trillions of life forms, got plants living on it. Some trees have trees living on them. You have uh, microbial life all over it, insects, birds, mammals living up in it. And then underneath the tree, you've got mycelium, this weird fungal network that the trees communicate with each other through. They share nutrients. I mean, just so much going on. You know, a single tree is a, it, it is a monument to life, you know, just real magic, like a supernatural spell busting up out of the ground, just reaching to the sky, you know, and they, they breathe, they, they give shelter, they give food, you know, trees, amazing. That's just trees, you know, and how many people, walk by a tree, walk by, walk by trees every day, never think twice about it, you know? And yet, if somebody comes to them with a claim, some wild and crazy, extraordinary claim that's just so magical and mind blowing, they feel this sense of awe and this, this amazing excitement. And they're like, wow, and they get sucked in. And, you know, there goes 20% of their income and there goes half their time and who knows what else. When, hey, maybe just a single tree could have filled that little void, you know, and gave, given them enough excitement for the day. Who knows? But yeah, we, we've got enough going on in this universe, on this planet, to excite anyone, a child, an adult, anyone, regardless of education, intelligence, whatever. None of that matters. If you're human, let me get in front of you, and I will turn you on to what's happening around you. There's no way. Even that, another thing is quickly is the human story this breaks my heart the human story our own story lost on most people you know um homo erectus our ancestors these amazing humans they were the first people that we know of to consistently control fire build shelters they made 
you know, beautiful Acheulean hand axes, these stone chopping tools. They uh, expanded throughout Africa. They were the first humans that we know of to expand out of Africa. I mean, think about that, Homo erectus, the first human eyes to see mountains in Europe, forests in Asia. You know, they, they built rafts, they crossed you know, water. I mean, they did so much. It's incredibly inspiring. And yet most people on planet earth right now, if you ask them about Homo erectus, don't know anything about it, nothing, you know? But you can ask them about, you know, certain mythologies or whatever. And yeah, they'll give you the rundown right away, you know, because they want that. They want that great grand story that can excite and give them confidence, maybe things like that. And, and we've got it, you know, science, history, prehistory, archaeologists. We, it's all there. It's so much is there for us. And so a lot of people listening to me right now, you, you may be very good at... Uh, busting an extraordinary claim and saying, you know, explaining why something probably isn't true. But like I said earlier, don't leave it at that, okay? Do more, reach inside that, that human in front of you when you're having that encounter and help them, help them not just get past one single irrational belief, help them become a better thinker, a learner and a fired up passionate human forever. That should be the goal, you know, don't, don't be satisfied to just win little battles, try to win the war, you know, the war for that person's brain, so they can get the most out of their life, they can really squeeze as much as they possibly can out of existence, you know, that's what you want, that's what you want. Um, I recall <laughs> one quick story, I uh, lived in the Cayman Islands many years ago, and I was, uh, screwing around in the water, snorkeling. And these guys were, were um, spear fishing near me. So it was blood in the water. It was really early in the morning. And I saw this beautiful sea turtle, baby sea turtle cruising around. I started chasing after it, you know, not harassing it from a distance. I just wanted to see it up close. And I was cruising around after it and went out pretty far out in the reef. And this is way over on the, the, uh, the uninhabited end of Grand Cayman, away from all the tourists and everything, beautiful spot. And it was such a gorgeous morning. You know, there were, there were shafts of sunlight coming down through the, the clear water and that baby turtle was there. It was just a beautiful moment. You know, I was just loving life. And then I looked over and about three or four feet away from me, that close, seven foot bull shark with the most snaggly, scary looking teeth hanging out of its mouth. And it was so, a bull shark is a very thick, kind of robust shark, you know? And I just got, you know, full adrenaline surge. I mean, absolute panic in my head. And luckily I reacted, you know, I retracted all appendages and I faced it. I did all the things I had read somewhere to do, not start splashing in the water. But I remember even in that moment, and the point of this is to show you, how beautiful it is to have passion and minimal understanding of the world around us. As I looked at that shark and I started slowly retreating and hoping I would live, I, um, <clears throat> I remember, oh, I just couldn't help myself. I admired how beautiful it was. It was so symmetrical. I was like surging, trying to maintain you know, position and then go back calmly. But the, the incoming swells were causing me to surge a lot in the water as I'm watching it. And it was just motionless, like just looking at me, these enormous creepy eyes. And I remember thinking, my God, that's amazing. You know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution carved out that creature to be like a fighter jet, you know, just so like hydrodynamic and it was so beautiful, amazing. And then uh, a year later, funny little epilogue, I went to some aquarium and I was standing there in front of this giant aquarium, all these fish going by a bull shark cruises by, just a bull shark. I looked at it, all of a sudden I got weird chills and I felt nervous and upset and I just felt electrified. I felt really uncomfortable. I was like, what the hell's going on? And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, I had some sort of little weird PTSD. And right away, I turned it into a little brain lesson, you know, about how my amygdala were glowing like hot coals, you know, from that terrifying experience a year ago. And they kicked in bull shark freak out you're scared of that thing really really yeah so anyway but yeah little things like that um that adds you know, excitement to a life it really does it, it breaks my heart that that so many people 
kind of stuff. I don't mean this in any condescending way. I mean, I'm sure they have love in their life. They have beautiful lives, but they, they, they're in a sense stumbling. They're, they're, they've got blinders on. They're not getting as much as they could out of life by not committing themselves to try to sift through the, the lies and the frauds and the madness and the errors and get to the real stuff because the real stuff, that's where it's at. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than that. Gotta love it. Um, I was thinking one of the one of the uh, practical things that I would love to pass on tonight, and it's it's important because in my uh, this is personal observations. I don't have data behind it, but I'm pretty confident the primary problem we're seeing in society right now, if not one of the worst problems is choice uh, source selection, your choice of news and information sources, okay? And this is crucial. And everybody listening, please focus in on that, on this, when you talk to others, when you're trying to help people be better critical thinkers, because it is amazing. You know, the biases are important, the, uh, the lack of education on certain topics are important, but my gosh, I've noticed over and over over the years, information sources, news sources, that's what's leading so many people down these dark rabbit holes and keeping them there and making them so confident because it's never been worse. You know, social media, all these websites that just pour out propaganda. You've got to be your own editor. You've got to be your own publisher, your, your own news editor today. It's never been more important with the internet. And so this is, uh, you know, getting away from all my passionate stuff. This is nitty gritty practical stuff for down in the trenches. And you have to emphasize it with people. Um, in one of my books, Think Before You Like about social media, I emphasize this, and I recall there was a, a Stanford study, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but really good Stanford study that looked at students, middle school, high school, and university students, and just uh, analyzed how well they're able to handle fake news, advertise, advertorials, you know, advertisements that come in the form of a news article, and it was terrible. More than 80% of students you know, didn't know the difference between uh, an, uh, an article that's really an ad, but looks like a news article. And even though it would, said sponsor, it would say sponsored content, they didn't pick up on it. Um, kids don't know how to uh, emphasize uh, the, uh, the source, the information source. When they, do, when they do a Google search, the vast majority of kids, and I'm thinking adults as well, they just go with the top Google results, whatever's there. You know, that Google algorithm is going to feed you search results that it thinks you like, you need. So if you're a climate science denier, you'll get all kinds of cookie sites that back up that feeling. <clears throat> if you're a climate scientist, you'll get all the, you know, great science sites. It's going to know who you are and feed you that. But people don't think about these things. They just click on the thing. And most people will go to that website, suck up that material without even thinking about who's behind it what's the agenda who's telling you this how do they know you've got to do that so please emphasize that because that really is just a crisis right now the the, the problem with people trusting any source of information and just to tell you how to do it make sure you know you know a good skeptic that's the first thing you look at you know, I don't even, unless I'm specifically doing research and I want to see how the other half is living, I don't go near kooky websites and kooky people and stuff. Only if I am in the mindset of, yeah, I want to see what's going on here. Because just the mere exposure effect, you know, you don't want that stuff in your head. You know, if you, if you read bogus facts, bogus material, just, just seeing it can make you more likely to be seduced by it later on a month later, or a year later. So it's really, it's dangerous, toxic stuff. You gotta be careful of that. So teach people that. Um, before we run out of time, I wanted to show, there's a couple of flyers I've made, PDFs, that I wanna send to everyone listening. And I want you guys to pass them on. These are PDF format. 
And I put them together, just extracts from my books, things I've observed, things I think that work, you know, I've learned from talks, things that connect with people. Um, and what I want you to do, just write down or somewhere to be posted my email address. Send me an email, guyfeedback at gmail.com, and I'll send you all these. I've got like four or five good ones that I'll send you, and you can pass them on. But like this one, what is good thinking? You know, this one covers what is it? that makes a good thinker. Such a basic thing, so important. What qualifies is good thinking. We all wanna be good thinkers, right? Most people think that, you know, we are good thinkers, but are we? A good thinker has to have an understanding and appreciation of the human brain. Like I mentioned earlier, it's workings, it's evolution, the, uh, the little quirks and stuff. You know, our brain did not evolve for this, this 21st century high, high tech, fast paced, loud, you know, uh, strangers everywhere lifestyle that we're all living now. 99.9% .9 of our existence, we were hunter gatherers living in very small communities. We were relying on each other and we were concerned with now and the very short term future. And we didn't have 50,000 lies coming at us every day, you know? So our brains are just not set up to really naturally instinctually cope with what we are challenged with today. That's important to be in a good thinker. Just, just the awareness of that goes a long way. Um, vision and memory. So many people do not know how vision and memory work and the limitations of them. Think about that. I mean, vision is pretty important, right? Memory, pretty important, right? We sure, it's sure a big deal when we lose it, you know, either one of those. But yet most people don't realize, they, they, think, they think when we look at something, we see what's in front of us. Not true. Reflected light goes in through our eyes, presents this information to our brain, which cobbles together, edits a presentation of that reality, highly edited presentation of that reality presents to our brain. Okay, it's leaving a lot of stuff out, in some cases, it's even adding things that should be there, we expect to be there, but aren't there. I mean, human vision, completely unreliable, okay? Useful, practical, of course. I'm not against it. I'm all for human vision, but you must understand the limitations of it. You know, I, I always, I'm always talking to UFO enthusiasts about this, but it's so crucial we understand that memory. Uh, there's been a survey conducted that found that most people think that human memory works like a video camera, that we just record everything and replay it in our head. Totally wrong. Okay, human memory is uh, the way I describe it in one of my books. Human memory is like you have this little old man that lives inside your head, okay, and he sits around a campfire. And when you try to recall something that happened to you in the past, you ask the old man and he tells you a story about it. Okay, he tells you a campfire story about your past. And like all good storytellers, he leaves out the boring parts. He maybe spices it up a bit. And he only feeds you the parts he thinks you need to hear that might help you out. You know, he's trying to help you. But it's not an accurate, full presentation of what really happened. And so that, you know, just understanding that can, can help you out, get you out of a lot of a lot of problems, you know, because you realize your memory is not 100%. And think about just what I said right there, vision and memory, those problems. Think about what that does to so many eyewitness accounts of Bigfoot, UFOs, those things. I'm not saying discount, discount them. I'm not saying those things are impossible. I'm not saying don't investigate. But understand, an eyewitness, uh, somebody remembering what they saw, not good enough. If the claim is something spectacular, like a 10 foot primate in you know, Northwest America or an alien spacecraft hovering over our city, you need more than somebody remembering something they saw, okay? Because we're humans and it, and it doesn't matter if it's a pilot or you know, pilots have human brains as well. They operate with human eyes, same thing. They're only marginally better than anyone else because they're humans. Um, the subconscious factor in our thinking, absolutely crucial. Yeah, we've got to understand. <laughs> I interviewed one scientist. I mean, I thought, oh, I thought, oh yeah, I know, I know a little bit about the brain, right? I'm talking to this 
neuroscientist, I'm like, how much of our daily thinking is subconscious? And I, this is years ago, and I thought he would say half or 75%. No, he said 99.9% of it is all just subconscious stuff under the surface here going on in our brains. Think about that. That's amazing. That is amazing. And I won't even get into a free will discussion. We'll never finish this. But, but you're, you, so much of your conscious thinking is just, it's just voices from below feeding you all these decisions and stuff. And then you as this supposedly aware person, you're accepting and defending these things that your subconscious has whispered to you or whatever, or screamed to you. And it all makes sense because your subconscious told you and you don't really think about it. That's why it's crucial to second guess yourself all the time. You have to, you know, you have to wonder, okay, did my subconscious, you know, give me a bum steer, a little quick immediate reaction to whatever's in front of me. Do I need to slow down here, second guess it? Do I really want to buy this thing in front of me? Or do I just like it because it's at eye level or because it's you know packaged in my favorite color or something? Got to think about it. Um, <clears throat> courage, maturity. People don't talk about that much. But yeah, to be a good skeptic, to be, to be a really good critical thinker, you got to be brave. You got to be mature because it means you're not afraid to say, I don't know. You can't be afraid to say, wow, I was wrong. I'm totally wrong about that. I need to change my mind. So yeah, with it comes this, this necessity, this absolute necessity <clears throat> to, be, to be bold and confident in yourself enough that you can say, you know what, I'm human. I'm going to be wrong a lot throughout life. So I'm constantly going to, going to second guess myself and I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be eager, happy to change my mind. It may be uncomfortable in the moment, but you should be proud of yourself. Every time you revise and you reconsider and you, you change course, you know, don't just keep going down the same path in something because you don't want to change. If you're wrong, you're wrong. That's okay. That means you're human. It's not a big deal. And the last thing I'll say about being a good thinker is uh, humility. You've got to be humble. If you're an arrogant skeptic, you're not doing it right. Okay, you've got to be humble. Because like I've mentioned several times already, you know, being human means being wrong many times. So stay humble. That is crucial. Um, like I said, one more time, I want to tell you, I've got, got all these PDF flyers. Send them to me. All right, send them to me. Your uh, email address, guyfeedback at gmail.com. Guyfeedback at gmail.com. And I will blast those to you. And I want you to pass them on because it's, uh, it's really rewarding. You know, uh, some people have the idea that skeptics are necessarily raining on the parade. You know, we're taking something away from people. Not at all. Be positive. Be constructive. That's how I, that's how I operate. You know, I'm trying to add. And what, what I constantly do in my books, you know, I try to be so positive that people don't feel like it is a, uh, it's a conflict. It's not a, it's not a debate. It's not an argument. You know, we're on the same side. Most people want to be right. Most people want to be, you know, connected to reality, believe it or not. <laughs> it doesn't always seem that way, but they do. Most people believe what they believe because they think it's true. Okay, looking at them from the outside, sometimes that may seem hard to believe, but it's true. They do. They want to be right. So I always attempt, and I think you should as well, attempt to align yourselves with them. Help them understand that you want to be side by side with them, not, not butting heads with them, but standing shoulder to shoulder with them, looking at some claim and analyzing it together addressing it together, trying to pick it apart together so that you can figure out if it's a good claim or just, you know, a hollow lie or something. And when you do that together, I think you get further. I, I've experienced that many, many times. And, and again, the audience, you guys listening to this right now, the fact that you're connected in this little bubble of CFI skeptics and all, the fact that you're even in this world listening to me right now means you're, you're halfway there. You care. Something brought you to an event like this. And, and, you know, that's great, but you're not all the way there. 
help make the world better. Reach out to people around you, family members, friends, strangers. I mean, don't get weird about it, but you know, as often as you can, reach out to people and excite them about the universe. Excite them about the life that's all around us. Excite them about their own species and the human brain. You know, the, the human brain, this, this uh, you know, three pound blob of electrochemical magic can just, it can imagine anything. I can imagine the universe. Multi, more than the universe. I can imagine multiverses. Well, kind of. Sometimes it feels a bit incomprehensible. But yeah, I mean, the human brain is so limitless and yet heartbreaking. So many people squander its greatest power. And that's, that's the power of the human brain to overcome the human brain for all its shortcomings, for all its uh, quirky diversions and the madness that are just so easy. So, so many mistakes the human brain can, can lead us to. It can overcome them all if we just commit ourselves to using it. You know, I, I, I wrote, uh, I think it was an essay, you know, it's such a shame that we can't see our brains. It, it, I wish we had transparent domes for heads. We could all see our brains and just walk around looking at everybody else's brain and you could see your brain because then maybe we would appreciate them more. We would understand like what a magnificent thing it is, you know? It's, it's inside a brain, there's this dense, like forest of neurons, you know? These, these little cells that the dendrites connect and all these thoughts rocket around and the networks are constantly changing. You know, that's just shocking. I, what one scientist I read uh, said there are more, there are something like there are more potential uh, patterns neural patterns in a human brain than there are atoms in the universe. <laughs> I mean, that sounds ridiculous to me, but hey, he was an expert. I guess he knows. I don't know to do the math on that, but wow. I mean, the human brain is magnificent. So learn about it and encourage others to learn about it. I mean, there's, there's really nothing more important because what are you but your brain? You know, I mean, if you, you know, the, the body is, you know, wonderful. I love the human body. You know, I love it. It's great. You know, it does so much. I'm a runner. I love being active and moving and climbing mountains and all that stuff. But the brain, that's really where it's at. So take care of it, you know, and understand. Here's another thing, crucial information that I hope everyone is aware of. And I hope you will consistently throughout your life teach others. The brain needs your help. Okay. You've got to understand throughout your life, absolutely vital that you remain physically active, exercise, walk, run, bike, swim, do whatever you can, move. The brain evolved, the human brain evolved on a mobile platform, okay? We are, we are meant to be moving, not planted in chairs 24 seven, sitting on couches 24 seven, that's not us. You know, so do that for your brain. Understand just a little, at least a little about the nutritional requirements of a brain. You know, it, the brain loves leafy green vegetables, okay? It loves water. The brain loves blueberries. If you're not eating blueberries, you might as well kill yourself, all right? Listen, eat the stuff the brain loves. And none of it is any kind of, ma you know, I gotta be very careful. There's no magical ingredient that makes you super smart or anything like that. We evolved as humans to eat a pretty, a pretty basic, simple, but diverse diet, you know, nuts, fish, vegetables, fruit, that kind of stuff. It's pretty simple, really. Get that diverse diet, eat real food. And, and one of the most important things you can do for your brain is learn. Yeah, throughout your life, learn new things all the time. Challenge yourself. And, and don't just play brain games on your phone or something like that. I mean, I, like, nothing wrong with that, I guess. But much more valuable use of your time would be learn to crochet, learn to sculpt, try tennis. If you've never played tennis before, go try it. Take it up. Um, do new things, things with your hands. Learn to play the violin. You know, give the piano a shot, whatever. Try juggling. Just by doing that, you will increase 
those those patterns that that neural forest you'll grow more trees you know in your brain so do that as much as you can encourage others okay have a sharp brain and use it sorry i see you're gonna tell me i gotta go aren't you oh okay <laughs> but um yeah i you know as you can tell i get really excited about the human brain about science history about our species about the universe and Anyone can, there's nothing special about me. I just lucked in, you know, I bumped into a few books at a young age and I, I never stopped learning and I never will, you know, and my life is better for it. And anyone can walk this path. So all you people listening, please encourage others to get on that train, learn about the brain, appreciate it, love it, admire it, feed it well, exercise it and value its, its ability to see through the madness. guy oh my goodness thank you so much for sorry that. I, ho I hope I, I didn't uh, I, I think I got I got a little fire and brimstone there for you but you know <laughs> no I that is exactly what we need I All mean right, you, you yeah. said at the outset that you were going to challenge us and you know I I, I do believe that's valuable because we can get really comfortable in our own perceived intelligence so to speak yeah. and you know they we think we got it so <laughs> you know, but but yeah. so much better to share. Um, I, you 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 gave us a lot, and I do want to get to questions because we have a ton of questions. But I I don't know if I agree with you about seeing the human brain because for me, I <laughs> I automatically thought that's just one more thing I need to accessorize. Like, how am I how am I dressing my brain? Um, but it's beautiful, I, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. Beautiful. I'll take you where. Well, maybe if they're looking at their at the at the at my brain, they're not looking at my new love handles. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> I think before you like, I I I really like that. I had a friend who always advised me before you hit send, think: Do you want to make an enemy or do you want to make a friend? I think it's along those same lines to give yourself that pause, uh, but before you commit yourself to a course of action. Uh, um, that that is unwise. Uh, I, I love the reminding us that there are limitations to human vision and memory, you know, because I remember yeah. the 90s completely differently than the folks I went to college with. <laughs> I have a whole different remembrance. And I, I I really do. I really enjoyed that that story of you, you know, seeing the sea turtle and and following it. And then I think that's what the shark was thinking. Hey, there's a human. I'm going to follow him. Yeah. Look what he's doing. <laughs> This is amazing. Life is fantastic. Yeah. I didn't know I ordered lunch. <laughs> you know, can, hey, please let me add right there because I, I'm such a conservation minded person. That shark, I, I was I was in the wrong because I was swimming around in bloodied waters. And that shark mm. was just looking for the fish that was bleeding. He wasn't harassing. He wasn't coming after me. And even though it you know, terrified me. Right, I, right. I placed no I placed no blame on the shark. I was in his neighborhood and there I was love blood it. in the water. So I, you know, don't I don't want to I don't want to cast any kind of shade on sharks. Okay. Let's no, get back no to problem. Right. The, the shark, the shark's attorney uh, will take your deposition <laughs> and believes your your right. uh, account of the matter. Uh, but we have lots of questions that I want to get to, and a lot of them are actually about uh, what books you might recommend or what books people should start with um if they're they're ready to learn more about this and one of would one of your books actually be good to start with yeah okay well, real quick first of all uh forget me for this for a second the demon okay. haunted world by carl sagan every yes. human on the planet should read that book i mean carl sagan he touched me at a very young age cosmos the book and the series and he's just mm -hmm. so eloquent he he he's just a great great science communicator you know and we miss yeah. him it's too bad he died young yes. you know but uh yeah i highly recommend the demon haunted world by carl sagan um quick run through my books real quick and these and i'm not doing a big sales pitch here i'll do this in 20 seconds most of my books are available in public libraries around the world 50 reasons people give for believing in a God 2008 published still going strong. I get compliment. I get comments from people around the world all the time. It's a skeptics reaction to many of the most common religious claims of all religions. And, and it's, it's, this book's known for being uh, very polite, respectful of religious people, okay. which is great. That's what I wanted to do. Cause I, you know, I, 
I, I want to be friends. I'm not here to make enemies. I love everybody. So I'm happy. This book, Race and Reality, it, it's my attempt to explain the concept of race, the science of who we are, our real biological diversity, the history of the concept of race, and present a scientific argument against racism, not just a let's all hold hands and love each other, but hey, racism is also very stupid because it's not oh, yeah. aligned with actual science. And this book, done very well. I'm so happy. It's been uh, several anthropology professors have rec made it recommended reading in the classes. It's used by some anti-racism programs, even one in South Africa. The, uh, the Holocaust Center in Johannesburg uses it as a part of their anti-racism program. So wow. really happy that book has gotten some mileage. Um, this one, Think, Thanks. Why You Should Question Everyone, very thin book. And this mm -hmm. one's appropriate for young readers, adults too, but I wrote it really thinking of like a typical high school kid or somebody like that. It's kind of an intro to critical thinking. And okay. this book was a uh, random house named it uh, part of their common reads first year experience program. So it, it's uh, recommended reading for all first year university students, you know, so that's pretty cool. Um, 50 simple questions for every Christian. Another book specifically about religion. This narrow, this zeroes in just on Christianity because it's the world's most popular religion right now in our moment in history. And again, like my other book about religion, very respectful. I'm not name calling. I, I be as I, I try to be as gentle as I can. And the feedback from this book's been, but like the other one, I, I'm not. Some people were offended, but I tried so hard. I've been over backward to be kind and just say, this is why not everyone's convinced of these claims. Understand that, you know, to the believers. So this okay. is a good book for both skeptics and Christians, you know, because it's an attempt to kind of bridge the gap there and get more understanding between the two. Because many, I, I'm like a lot of uh, skeptics out there of religion in that I don't really care what people believe. It's fine. You know, I just don't want you to hurt yourself. I don't want you to waste time, waste money, divide the world unnecessarily. I, I just want everybody to get the most they can out of the life and to be positive and to cooperate. Yeah. You know, that's what I want. So that, that comes through in my books. This one, real quick, I'll pick up the pace here. 50 Popular Beliefs that people think are true. This is a fun but grand tour of UFOs, Bigfoot, oh, um, okay. ESP, you know, anti-vaccine chapter in here. And this was, I really enjoyed writing that book because, you know, I'm still a kid at heart. I like, you know, I, I love, see that you have yeah. such, you have such a, you, you remind me so much of my dad in the sense that oh. he had such a youthful energy all the time and it's like yeah. wow I, and i and i love that i wish i had inherited that yeah i'm an old, I'll, I'm an old grump i've been an old grump since the age no. of five <laughs> yeah I, i'll be dead soon enough i'm not going to bother growing up you know i'm going to stay remain a child but but yeah um this book good thinking good book for okay. it's an yes. overview this has got brain anatomy brain evolution brain nutrition exercise all that stuff i mentioned okay. it's all in okay. here uh, I talk about many of the biases, subconscious biases, shortcuts our brains naturally take when we're trying to think and, and uh, make decisions, how you can guard against them and, and use your brain better. That's kind of a practical handbook is the way I approach that. Um, okay. Think before you like, social media. Yes. This book, I, I wrote this book about three years ago and it's amazing all that's happened in the last three or four years. I can't, I can't, friends are annoyed with me because I'm always saying, hey, I said that was going to happen. I knew the world was going to go nuts. I told you so, you know, because it's all in here about how fake news, um, mm. uh, source selection, uh, privacy, addiction, you know, issues, all this kind of stuff is in here. And it's and, and the thing is, I'm not anti social media. I'm definitely not anti internet. But I, I have the kind of the basic theme of this book is that you need to use the technology and not let the technology use you because exactly. It's, yeah, it's you versus thousands of engineers on the other side of the screen who are trying to manipulate your brain and send you here and there and exploit you and all this stuff. Algorithms are, you know, they're just spanking your butt every day if you're not aware and you gotta you gotta resist you know resistance been, is not futile there have been some very good documentaries about that that are very enlightening yeah um, yeah, I, yeah yeah that just it makes you oof. 
Yeah. And what do you got? Last, what else? Last book, most recent book. And I love this book. I really like if this is the book I wrote because I wanted to have this book. I mean, that's kind of a weird self-indulgent thing, but I loved writing this book. I think I did it just because I, I wanted an excuse to interview and to research so many cool science uh, scientists and, and science, because this is a this is a, a grand tour of everything that I think everybody should know about the universe about ourselves you know this is and and what I did I took the basic journalist questions who what why when where and I applied it to reality who are we how did we get here when did everything begin you know where where are we where are we in space? Where are, you know, just questions like that. It, it and, feels, it feels like a, a good Wednesday night in college. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, seriously. I, yeah. And I wrote it where you could flip to any page and go, damn, that's weird. You know, and, and it's not even me. I'm not, dude, listen, I'm going to be clear. I'm not claiming to be Shakespeare or anything like that. Okay. The, the, what makes this book amazing is the quotes from the scientists I interviewed the work, the hard work of historians, archeologists, scientists that they did, you know, to uncover our reality. And and I I just kind of translated their work into easy, easy to understand English. You know, a high school kid would not be stumped or, 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 you know, confused on any page in this book. So it's all all about that. Oh, here's the Japanese, check that out. Japanese translation of think. I like that. Look at cover. you. Cool. That's great. I was, so, I, was so in, what, I was in Tokyo and I saw it on a shelf there and I thought, cool. You, I, made, you it, I, I made it to yeah. Asia. Yeah. Look, Ma. <laughs> Aww. So so what we're what we're really saying here is that you are your own college course. Like we could have a whole <laughs> semester at minimum, minimum of your writing and to get our brains in shape. Um, yeah, but, is- but Leanne, I am just I, I'm just bouncing I, i'm look the real heroes like i said are the scientists the historians mm-hmm. the archaeologists okay. out there they i i value the work of scientists so much i really do i i give them full credit the only, the only thing i do is i dive in and i try to screen what they're doing out there to uh, to others to okay. so that others will value them more because nice. science is so beautiful and powerful. It's not perfect. It's not a religion. It's, it's a problem, you know, atomic bombs, napalm, okay? Science is a tool and we can use it for better or worse. But, but I tell you, when we use it for, for good, oh my gosh, science can take us anywhere. And you as a fellow beloved Star Trek fan, you know, <laughs> science yes. has the potential to take yes. us anywhere. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But science wielded by fallible humans. Exactly. Yes. And there's the problem. Yeah. Well, said. there's yeah, the problem. Yeah. There's the problem. Now, yeah. someone because clearly familiar with your work, because I do want to get in a couple of questions here and because we've we've almost just run out of time. But the the the, the 50 questions uh, for every um, for Christians, 50 simple questions. OK, they want to know. Scott wants to know, have you thought about doing sort of a 50 simple questions for every QAnon? believe oh wow um it, it depends on if QAnon has the staying power because it could be gone in a year or two i don't do know you if Q- really think so oh, i mean people well, are really wrestling with this oh but wait a minute that that's not a sign that's not an optimistic statement i mean something more insane and crazy will replace oh it. oh, oh sure but, okay uh, Woof. yeah you had more, me there it, for a second <laughs> now before actually i thought about doing a 50 simple questions for every muslim and because it's that's the second most popular religion in the world right. but uh there's so many books i i've already got two right now in the can i'm working on and okay. i just you know I, I can't live long enough to do all the books i want to do so it's really hard but yeah if QAnon bec- if QAnon takes over the world and becomes some sort of leading you know religion or something sure i'll jump in and go at it good question though yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can put that on your calendar for 2023, perhaps. Yeah, okay, yeah, right, right. <laughs> you never know. Um, Leonard says that when uh, people or children think critically, they have a strong tendency to question authority, which is kind of what happened in my house in my teenage years. And, and this creates a, a backlash. Should we still do it? 
you know, you got kids yeah. now arguing with their, okay, that's, that, <laughs> it's worth yeah, it. That's it. Le Leonard asks a great practical question. As a parent, I've experienced it. But you know what? You should be able to defend and explain mm. everything you do as a parent. So it's good. I, I There's nothing I told my kid. Well, my kids will probably challenge me on this, but in their childhood, when they were very young, I don't think there's anything I told them, don't do that or do this, that I could not rationally defend as being for their own good or for the family's own good or something or simply because it was a survival thing in society or whatever, because you, 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 you want your children to be able to analyze and challenge authority, even you, even if it's uncomfortable, because when they get in that habit, when they see they can even question dear old dad, they'll do it later in life. They will yeah. challenge, they will challenge the crazy teacher they may get in high school who is insane and tries to teach them things that aren't true. They will challenge the, uh, uh, the person on the street corner that's trying to sell them some nonsense, you know, they, yeah. they will challenge these people because they've already done it with mom and dad. So you will make them comfortable at being skeptical of things. And you shouldn't have to just say something, do it because I say so. I know we all do as parents. I'm sure I've said at that. some point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Don't put your hand but, in the wood chipper. Yes. Yeah, but you should be able to <laughs> back, you should be able to back it up with some kind of evidence based logic i i am i am very proud to say that i feel like i am living proof of that my dad uh was very big on raising me to to ask questions and we'd go back and forth you know we'd debate things and then he yeah. would swing me to his side and then and then say okay now argue the other side you know so he oh, really yeah. was from the school that if i can do that with him and my mom the the most you know important authority figures in at least in my young life that i would not hesitate to do it with other grown-ups, you know, yeah. which which led to interesting times. <laughs> hey, your father's cool, I approve. Oh my, yeah, my dad, my my I my I say that my dad was a a king masquerading as a civil servant. Uh, good <laughs> stuff, very good stuff. Um, now listen, we are right at where we normally end. Do you, do you have five more minutes? Oh, of course. Of ask course. you. Okay, right. I just I just want to make sure because everyone who watches regularly, we usually have a hard stop at eight, but when we're having a really really engaging, you know, conversation conversation and in question um, section, I, I like to give just a little bit more time. And uh, KD wants to know, and this is an interesting question, in your opinion, is there anything about society, culture, or, or politics that's exempt from critical thinking? I, I would say Star um, Trek, but I am probably wrong. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a great question, something I, I hate to react instantly to because tomorrow okay. I'll think of a really cool answer. No, no, but I will react, but I'm, <laughs> I'll am i react anyway. But uh, I think maybe art, uh, because huh. if somebody comes up and says this lump of clay is the essence of pure universal beauty, I may say, oh, I don't think so. I don't see it. But you know what? That's okay. Who the hell am I to judge? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to how can I analyze that away? You know, I, maybe I could get popular opinion on the matter or something like that. But yeah, mm -hmm. art, uh, love can be subjective. It's you know, emotional. Isn't. So yeah, yeah, there's, we're not robots. Nobody wants to be, you know, uh, remember, remember, Leanne, Vulcans do have emotions. They just choose to, to, to uh, hold them back okay you're hitting so, me yeah. where i live right now <laughs> you're hitting me where i live because that would be my not... preferred species yeah. to be yeah <laughs> emotions mean... are messy <laughs> yeah. so so i'm open i'm open to answer that kd's is that kevin durant the basketball player talk? we're talking uh, to kd probably anyway. okay yeah anyway well kd i think yeah i am open to the possibility of there being huge realms of human endeavors out there that really are beyond uh, cold hard analysis that is trying to get down to it this is good or bad or right or wrong if that's what if that's what you mean absolutely because right. yeah like I said we're emotional creatures and uh, art you know hey if somebody calls I, something art I'm cool with it I think perhaps maybe we could have the best of both worlds you know knowing scientifically and and the, the knowing the science behind a sunrise does not in any way diminish its beauty or its awe you know so we, we get to have cool. it all, maybe? Yeah, I don't know. yeah, I like that. Now, now, you have given us a lot of books. 
a lot of resources, but Evelyn wants to know, is there a good tool, maybe, maybe you have a specific specific tool for evaluating sources? Because you said that's one of the things, like what, what are the sources that we're going to and we're looking, looking at? Is there a yeah. way for evaluating them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I detail, I'm, again, it's available in the public library. I'm not trying to sell books, but Think Before You Like has an entire section on how to evaluate sources online websites and all that. And, and I detail that Stanford study I mentioned about the common problems students have and probably adults as well, I'm sure. Um, but real briefly, the, the, big, the, the first thing is notice the source. Believe it or not, most people don't even think about where the article is from. Like for example, the Joe Rogan podcast, number one most popular podcast in the world. He yeah. has this, but listen, listen he, he has this great thing he does with this, uh, this Jamie guy, I believe his assistant who he, in real time while he's talking, he'll say, Jamie, look that up online. And they, it's great, they're like fact checking real time, but they, ne they almost never cite the source. So he mm -hmm. reads some headline or an article and you don't know, is that Alex Jones Infowars or is that right. Scientific okay. American? Like what the hell are we even talking about here? You know, and, and uh, you, you have to, step one, look at the source. And when you're not sure of the source, look and see if it's say if it's a news story okay about something that just happened see if mm -hmm. other news outlets are reporting the same thing if not okay. that's a okay. that's a warning sign because yeah, if yeah. it's a big, if it's something new important just happened it's really big everybody's going to be on it if they're not yeah, they are. something's wrong and another thing uh real quick there's a lot of things but um uh don't don't trust the the source itself to tell you about the source Google the source, because a lot of people will go to a website and they'll look at about, you know, the about the about yeah, yeah. the company or about the website or whatever about about yeah. us. But yeah, you're listening. You could be listening to a con artist describe how trustworthy they are. You don't want that. So Google them and let somebody else. A lot of times, you know, a cheap last thing I'll say, a, lot, a, a quick little easy cheat just put, say you got, you, you got a great new story about, you know, Bigfoot was just a body of Bigfoot was uncovered in Cape Walmart in Indiana. <laughs> okay, fine. That source that's telling you about it, put in their name and then just the word skeptic or scam as a keyword and see what comes up. And a lot of times somebody, you know, uh, the great warriors like Ben Radford or Joe Nickel will have already done an article on it somewhere, you know, and, and you'll see like, oh, wait a minute, these people are constantly producing bogus material or something. Okay. Then you kind of get on. Yeah, that's one way to expose stuff. But uh, yeah, think before you like that book has a whole section. Okay. And awesome. you know what, if somebody listen to me, I care so much, whoever that asked that question, if you can't find that book in your library, if you don't want to spend the money to buy one at the bookstore, email me guyfeedback at gmail i will copy that section and email it to you copy and paste it and email it to you so that you have it okay there you go can't get better than that guy thank you thank you so much and i i'm, I'm going to wrap this up but i'm going to let you know that scott has said uh that we need you to speak at psycon Oh. So, so there you go. Uh, from his mouth to Barry's ears, if Barry is <laughs> listening, I'm sure he is. Uh, but well, again, thank guy, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Yeah, I would love to see you at Psycon. You, you know, such a such a passionate speaker. This would be so awesome to watch you, not just in a box, uh, but <laughs> just to remind the audience that if you missed any of this, uh, the recording will be available uh, tomorrow at skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, please join us for the next Skeptical Inquirer Presents. That is on September 2nd, which is also my birthday. Uh, Callum Porco will be reminding us that there is no planet B, and that's going to be hosted by Jim Underdown. And of course, I give my, my thanks as always to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry, uh, our producer, Mark Kreidler, and to you, the audience. And my name is Leanne Lord. Thank you for spending your evening with us. Have a good night. Guy, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. This was great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. You're a pleasure. Seriously, you're a great host. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>